My name is Sean C.W. Korsgaard. I'm an award-winning photojournalist, U.S. Army veteran, and I've been playing Fire Emblem for close to 20 years now. Now, judging by the standing room only crowd we have in here, some of you have been fans of the franchise for a long time as well. Some since the Game Boy, some brand new, and hopefully we'll be taking a look at the history and what makes this franchise special. But to begin, we have to ask the question, what is Fire Emblem? And of course now the computer's freezing up. Oh. Uh, come on. And it's... Yeah. Ah, there we go. What button? Okay, so press the down button. Perfect. So, what is Fire Emblem? Is it a white knuckles tactical RPG that invented the genre of the tactical RPG and pushed gamers to the very limits since 1990? Is it a work of high fantasy, sweeping in scope, across multiple continents, hundreds of characters, worthy of anything in the genre? Is it a glorified dating sim? <laughs> Is it a combination of the three? Yes. For the brief overview, Fire Emblem is the original tactical RPG series, originally released in 1990. Since then, we, depending if you count spin-offs, crossovers, and Super Smash Brothers, 13, 16, or 19 games in the series. About half of them have been released in the United States, the other half, well, we'll get to those. But let's start with, seeing who here has been brushing up on their stuff, what work of Western fantasy helped inspire Fire Emblem? Hint, the author is Terry Brooks. You. Uh, wrong author, but you got half the title. Both of you, come on up, get a snack. Yes. The Sword of Shannara Trilogy by Terry Brooks was one of several Western fantasy series published in Japan in the early 1980s. It also helped inspire The Legend of Zelda. Specifically, the villain Ganon was based off the villain of the series. But, relevantly, high fantasy has played a big role in Fire Emblem. A lot of JRPGs pulled more from tabletop role-playing and fantasy. Dungeons and Dragons and the like, Ultima. And this gave us games like Final Fantasy. And while they're very, very good, they're not quite fantasy. Fire Emblem, on the other hand, pulls strictly from literary, almost, mythology. And this is partly because of one man in particular. Shozu Kaga, or as the Japanese fan base call him, Kaga-san. That is the gentleman on the left, if you're curious. The one on the right, to give you an idea of how important he is in JRPGs, is the man who created Final Fantasy. He began working at Nintendo, and specifically at Intelligent Systems, one of the Nintendo subsidiaries, on a game called Famicom Wars, pictured on the right. Now, he is a lifelong fan of medieval history, Western high fantasy, and classical mythology. And after working on Famicom Wars, which was a more traditional tactical game. It was the precursor to the Advanced Wars series. He wanted to create something that would incorporate that. And the result was Fire Emblem, a series he would head until the fifth game. The other founding figures were game designer Tohiro Nahi, let me make sure I get this right, Narahiro, character designer Daisuke Idazawa, and composer Yuka Su. Suji Yoko. Kaga left after the fifth game, but the other ones stayed around for various periods, and Yuka has stayed around to this very day as a sound supervisor on the games. But each of these figures played a key role, whether it be the familiar anime-esque designs of the characters, pulled because they recruited manga artists for the series because they couldn't afford proper ones, to the immortal soundtrack that has come with every game in the series. 
Now, this era of the franchise, which began with the first Fire Emblem game on the NES in 1990, happy birthday, Fire Emblem, <laughs> was a period of experimentation. Some of the stuff that we love about this franchise has been there be since the beginning. Turn-based strategy, permadeath. Others took a while to perfect. And this is part of why this era of the franchise is so important. Some things stayed around. Some world maps, fatigue, fog of war, did not. Now, for our next question, there were five Fire Emblem games released on the NES and SNES. Can anyone in here name two of them? You in the pink shirt. Fire Emblem Mystery of the Emblem? One. Come on, get one. And... Genealogy of the Holy War. Ah, you speak to my soul. Get a snack. <laughs> the five games of this era were Fire Emblem, Shadow Dragon, and the, Myst and the Blade of Light, which is where we get our boy Marth. Fire Emblem Gaiden, which was later remade, but we'll get to that in a bit. Fire Emblem Mystery of the Emblem, which is where they really start pushing the franchise. The first half was a remake of the first game, but the second half, we follow up on Marth and his comrades and see where they go from there. But Genealogy of the Holy War and Thracia 776 are where the franchise really starts to get daring. Or cruel, depending on how you judge this franchise. But let's take a deeper look at one of those, shall we? Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War. My favorite in the franchise for a reason. It follows a multi-generational story centered on father Sigurd and son Silif as they fight a holy war over the fate of a continent. It touches on everything from religious extremism to bigotry. And frankly, not a lot of RPGs manage to tackle such with such skill, especially for this era. But it also introduced a number of series core mechanics that we've come to count on from this franchise, whether it be relationships between characters, the child characters that have become a series staple, even the fact that these characters have skills. This all came in this part of the franchise. And to a certain extent, we've never reached that height, at least in terms of story direction. The closest comparison I can think of is Game of Thrones. And I mean that in terms of shocking character deaths, sudden plot turns, the level of medieval, I guess, medieval cruelty seen at some points in the story, and uh, some other aspects we'll get into in a moment. <laughs> Unfortunately, they know what I'm talking about. But here's the question. These games were hits in Japan. Why didn't they come here? And there are a few reasons for that, the big one being typical JRPG bias. For some reason or another, Japan seems to think we don't like these games. And it doesn't matter how many times we show them otherwise, Bravely Default, Xenoblade, Fire Emblem, they continue to be hesitant about bringing games over here. And unfortunately, this means a, roughly half the franchise has never come across the pond. Part two, though. Difficulty. I know this may seem strange to some of you who play on casual. You know who you are. <laughs> but Nintendo has a reputation for difficult games, and none more difficult than Fire Emblem. I know that's, again, for the Dark Souls generation, maybe strange to hear, but <laughs> Fire Emblem has always had a reputation as the hardest franchise Nintendo has ever made, some more than others. Thracia 776, to use an example, was, is considered probably the hardest game that ever came out in Nintendo prior to 2000. To give an example, three missions into the game, you are stripped of all your equipment, stripped of all your comrades, tossed into a prison cell, and asked to escape. And along the way, you are given a very, very important choice. There are lots of civilians in this prison with you. Do you risk trying to fight and save them? Or do you leave them to die to make your escape? Fire Emblem is built on choices like that. But the last thing, unfortunately, 
is that genealogy of the Holy War almost made it to the United States. And unfortunately, the localization team came to a sudden decision about character interactions in that game. Again, this is pieced together from 20-year-old gaming magazines, fan forums, interviews in Japanese, but the localization team, uh, the game has incest, people. Lots and lots of incest. And understandably, Nintendo was not thrilled about seeing how certain people in America reacted to that story development. So, Fire Emblem remained Japan only, and it might have for a long time to come. Even today, in all its successes, this important, critical part of the franchise has never made it to the United States. Legally, you cannot buy any of these games, much less in English. And unfortunately, that means there's only one way to do it. I won't tell you where, but I'm sure some of you know how to use Google. <laughs> now, the other thing is, towards the tail end of this era, Kaga left the franchise. There are a number of theories as to why. Nintendo claims he asked for more money and wanted more creative control. Kaga claims it was an issue of creative direction. Other people claim it's just Kaga wanting to do something new and Nintendo wanting more of the same. In the end, one of the most productive partnerships in Nintendo's history came to a sudden end with the release of Thracia 776. A Fire Emblem game that was scheduled to come out for the N64 was then canceled, and the franchise was mostly left in limbo until somebody decided to start making SNES-esque titles for the Game Boy. But don't feel too bad for Kaga. He's doing some of the best work of his career now, although it started a bit rocky. He had a franchise on the PlayStation called Tearing Saga. Pretty good. Uh, Nintendo sued the crap out of him. But he did recently release a game on Steam, a translation of a game called Visteria Saga. If any of you want a taste of old school Fire Emblem goodness without having to resort to piracy, this is a good way to do it. I recommend it. Quality game. But the more important thing is Fire Emblem did come to the West. How? Why? And a big part of that is timing. The 90s were a different time from the 2000s, especially for both anime, anime and fantasy. The Lord of the Rings had just become a billion dollar movie franchise. Harry Potter had sold so many books that the New York Times changed how they ran the bestseller list. And there was a boom in fantasy literature that, starting with Harry Potter, Aragon, and works of the like, continues to this very day. <coughs> Similarly, anime saw mainstream success in America that it never had before. Shows like Pokemon, Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, and programming blocks like Toonami helped to bring the, what was once a cottage industry of videotapes and fan dubs, into the mainstream. The time was right for a series like Fire Emblem, rooted in high fantasy, stylized like anime, and bone-crushing tactical difficulty all the same to come to America. All it needed was a right introduction. It got seven million of them. Judging by the applause, like me, this is where many of your loves with Fire Emblem began. Now, two characters were planned to be in Fire Emblem. Marth, being the original protagonist of the franchise, and Roy, who was the protagonist of what would be a soon-to-be-released Game Boy game. However, true to fashion, Nintendo wanted them to be Japan exclusive. One man, Sakurai, wouldn't have it. He fought to keep him. And there is a reason. Kaga may have created Fire Emblem, but Sakurai, he shared it with the world. Which is why we have the GBA GameCube era, where many of us began our first encounters with this wonderful, wonderful series. Yeah, good times. These games are almost 20 years old now. I hope you feel just as bad about that as me. Now, the mechanics of the game remained mostly unchanged during this period. Most of the experimentation instead was focused on taking advantage of the bigger space these games allowed. 
They didn't tell different stories, they told bigger ones. They didn't change the mechanics, they just made them look better, smoothed out the edges. And the results, for the most part, were phenomenal. Some other changes, they kept in mind that these games weren't just being made for the Japanese hardcore fans anymore. They were being shared with the world, and uh, they decided to give us a safety vest as we did it. The difficulty was brought down a great deal for a lot of these games, to the point the first Fire Emblem game in the West had a tutorial. Today, one of the only ones in franchise history that we'd recognize as a tutorial. Now, here's the question. Name the three protagonists of that Fire Emblem game. We're going to start with you, Edelgard. Grab yourself another one. Now, the odd thing about bringing this game in particular to America, Fire Emblem the Blazing Blade as it's known in Japan, Fire Emblem as it's known here in the States, is that it is a prequel to this date, you actually cannot get the game. It's a prequel to Fire Emblem The Blazing Blade, the game that has Roy in it, the game that has been advertised with every Fire Emblem game with Roy in it, in the United States legally. I just, from a Fire Emblem fan perspective, I probably don't need to explain, but it's like if Star Wars, we only got Revenge of the Sith instead of the original trilogy. <laughs> There will be no prequel apologism as in this room, sir. <laughs> oh, it was the best one in the prequels. <laughs> uh, <laughs> kidding, kidding. But there were five games released in this era. On the Game Boy, you had Fire Emblem slash Fire Emblem the, the Binding Blade, Fire Emblem the Blazing Blade, Fire Emblem the Sacred Stones, and then the first console release since the SNES era, Fire Emblem, Path of Radiance. Oh, again, you guys do my soul well. Yeah, take in that beautiful, beautiful cover art. I hope you guys bought it when it came out, because otherwise you will pay out the nose for it. Now, this game in particular, Path of Radiance, follows Ike, leader of the Grail Mercenaries, as they navigate a war-spanning Tellius and the racial conflict between the humans and beastmen that inhabit it. It had the same turn-based story, gripping fantasy, and of course, white knuckle difficulty we've come to know and love, but there were some major differences this time around, partly because it was shaped by Western opinion. The biggest, Ike. He was the first protagonist in series history who wasn't a prince, wasn't nobility, and was a commoner. That was made with our tastes in mind, and I think it worked out beautifully, didn't it, for people who've played the game, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes it did. And it sold very well. Despite coming out in the tail end of the GameCube's life cycle, it was one of the best-selling games on the system. It's one of the few Fire Emblem games to get a direct sequel, which is, unfortunately, also where the problems began. Take that back. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. The game is... The game is wonderful. The issue is with Nintendo, unfortunately. Radiant Dawn was a phenomenal game. It, however, like many games not made for children or senior citizens on the Wii, <laughs> again, issue is with Nintendo, not with us, not with Fire Emblem. The game didn't sell very well. In fact, it did terribly enough that Nintendo made some pretty significant cuts to intelligent systems. The only two games that would come out for five years were remakes. Worse, lazy remakes. They actually just reused a lot of sprites from the Game Boy era for these. In fact, sales kept getting worse. Nintendo was calling a lot of its longtime franchises. This is why you uh, haven't seen a new F-Zero, new Star Fox, new Metroid. Yeah, this hurts. And Fire Emblem, may have been one of them. Nintendo came to Intelligent Systems with a directive. Your next game sells 250,000 copies, or your next game will be the last Fire Emblem game. Now, understandably, like most people put under pressure, Intelligent Systems was desperate at first. Early pitches for the next game range from setting it in the War on Terror, I kid you not, <laughs> 
to setting it in far future Mars. Eventually, though, they came to a different decision, the right decision in my point of view. They knew what worked about Fire Emblem, so they took it all, turned it up to 11, gave us what we wanted, and then just put it out to port and trusted that we would follow. They put in elements that people had been asking since the SNES era. An example is Genealogy the Holy War's generational system. They added a casual mode for the first time in the franchise. Or did they? But we'll get to that again. Now, here's the thing. They needed to sell 250,000 copies. They sold two and a half million. They were, yes, yes. They were expecting a last stand and instead they got a renaissance. Or perhaps better put, an awakening. <laughs> now, Fire Emblem Awakening had some controversial elements to the hardcore fans, like casual mode, but at the same time, it struck a balance. This was the first game to revisit another world of the pre app, to revisit some of the places the pre Fire Emblem games went. It's set in the same world as the first two, Fire Emblem Gaiden and Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon. You get to see what happened to the wars fought by Om, Celica, Marth, and their friends. And you get to give the happy ending that those worlds deserved. That's not nothing. If this had been the last Fire Emblem game, it would have been a fitting finale to the franchise. But instead, again, you guys came through. It sold 2.5 million copies. It is the best-selling game on the 3DS, not to involve Mario, Link, or a Pokemon. <laughs> Fire Emblem went from being a cult classic to one of Nintendo's moneymakers overnight. And the results? Well, we, we can just take a look around us to see some of that. But it did have one particular impact. The Fire Emblem fan base to this day is kind of split. Did Awakening save or destroy the franchise? This is stupid. <laughs> Again, we wouldn't be getting any Fire Emblem games without Awakening anymore. We owe the future of the franchise to an extent, to this game doing well, to the other games doing well. And if you don't like it, well, I have some friends who are fans of F-Zero and Golden Sun who would love to be in our position right now. <laughs> Again, the Japanese fan base is similarly divided. Specifically, they think the worst thing that intelligent systems ever did was water down the difficulty so that those awful Americans would buy those Fire Emblem games. It's the nature of any fan base once it starts growing. The old guard hates the new guard. But me personally, Fire Emblem's like pizza. You can't have a bad one as long as there's more. And again, to dig in that they watered this down for casuals, was it the first game in the franchise to have permadeath? Anyone want to volunteer to get some free candy? I couldn't hear you, but go ahead and grab one. The answer is no. Yeah, I know, it's on the card. Everyone makes mistakes. but. This is probably the era of Fire Emblem most of you don't need me to tell you too much about. We had Fire Emblem Awakening, the bad one, Fire Emblem Fates. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She's right, you know. Fire Emblem Echoes, Shadows of Valentia, which... Dear God, I hope somebody at Nintendo heard those woos. And, of course, Fire Emblem Three Houses, a.k.a. Fire Emblem Fates Done Right. I apologize again, but... Now, this era has a few departures from the classic franchise, the big one being it's fully voice acted, it's in 3D. The production values are, for the most part, better than they've ever been. 
these games look better than they ever have, and I certainly don't think there'll be many complaints in this room about that. We've also gotten something the game has never had before, courtesy of those massive sales numbers and this wonderful fan base we have. Spinoffs. Some of these have been very interesting, like... <laughs> Tokyo Mirage is very good, if you're a fan of Persona. If you're a fan of Fire Emblem, you're wondering why Martha's in a boy band all of a sudden. <laughs> And also, for the franchise that was shared with the world because of two fighters in Smash Brothers, we now have seven. That's right, we can field a whole bench. So, the question is, how has Fire Emblem stuck around for 30 years? Again, not to harp on a familiar note, but there are lots of video game franchises that never got that chance. Again, I would kill for a proper Golden Sun sequel. Ah, oh, that's good to hear. But the big one, again, is timing. It came to the West right when both anime and fantasy were becoming more popular with especially people our age than ever before. Its success has mirrored the growth of those genres. For a series like Fire Emblem that is stylized like many anime and manga, tells gripping high fantasy stories without let's just call them Final Fantasy-esque weirdness. <laughs> May there never be a Fire Emblem game that includes something as poor as Blitzball. <laughs> Sorry, it had to be said. It's almost perfectly tailored to be successful, given the modern markets of both gaming, fantasy, anime, there's something here for everyone. It dips toes in a lot of markets, which is why there are Fire Emblem cosplayers at anime conventions, why there are new fans to the franchise that there haven't been before, but it's more than that. Lots of games have anime stylings and fantasy trappings. What makes Fire Emblem special? The big one, a cast of hundreds. I could name certain YouTubers who recently trashed the franchise for having hundreds of characters. Polygon, ugh. Sorry, I'm getting over a bad cold. But Fire Emblem's specialty has been the fact that there are characters almost anyone can like. Every game has between 30 and 50 different characters, all with distinct personalities, looks, motives, backstories. And if you don't like one, well, bench them for someone you do. There are no wrong answers to which characters are the best in Fire Emblem. There's something for everyone, just bad cases to make for them. Except for you, Edelgard. I spent... I spent 20 years in this franchise fighting world-conquering tyrants, not to serve under them. But it goes to more than that, though. A cast of hundreds only goes so far. The first one is, compared to a lot of games, as an army veteran I can say this, the anime series filled with child soldiers does a better job portraying military life than most first-person shooters. <laughs> most movies and most games seem to think the military life, and the military in general, is filled with brown-haired white guys bulging with muscles and only one motive in life. The truth is, they're about as diverse as this room. Men, women, from every corner of the country, every walk of life. Some not quite sure why they're there, but willing to fight alongside their comrades. Mm -hmm. Fire Emblem does this very well. They focus on the key aspect that any military story should tell, camaraderie. And uh, the other thing is that, especially with Three Houses, they're going places that we haven't before. Dimitri is probably one of the best examples of post-traumatic stress disorder in gaming. You see characters that have struggled with killing, that worry about losing their friends. You don't see that in Call of Duty, as we'll dig into in a moment, I promise. I love hitting that pinata. 
another thing that Fire Emblem does that almost no other military game or, well, any combat game does, romance. Many people blast the game as a dating simulator. I'm not going to ask our veterans in the room to raise their hands if they know this, but as far back as the ancient thespians of Greece to the barracks parties on most military bases today, romance is a fact of military life. So is the fact that most of these people, and in Fire Emblem, are in their late teens and early 20s. They could die at any moment. Romance comes naturally. And so does death. And that's the bigger thing. Fire Emblem has gotten right since day one. Romance is fun, but it's not love that's the foundation of Fire Emblem. It's death. <laughs> Specifically, permadeath. It's the oldest signature. Yeah, yeah, yes. I'll let, yeah, yeah. Mourn your waifu later, people. There's a reason I kill her every time. Yeah, yeah, ugh. It's the oldest signature of the Fire Emblem franchise. It's been there since the first game, and unless you're one of the people who plays casual, again, you know who you are. It's still the foundation of the franchise, and it's probably the most impactful thing about the series. Always has been. This is where all that character development, the camaraderie, the connections, the romance, this is where it all comes back to twist a knife in your ribs. You make a wrong move. You get overextended. You fight an enemy that you shouldn't have. Maybe you just got greedy or you got a little lazy. Then the hit comes. The unit you've gotten to know, gotten to like, maybe even gotten to love. Know that they've got family back home, goals for after the war. They get hit, they go down. They gurgle out one last line of dialogue, something about mother, the loved ones they have back home, maybe about how much they just don't want to die here. And then they're gone. That is something that matters. Not just in Fire Emblem, but in gaming in general. The problem with death in gaming, and with tactical RPGs especially, is that most, take, most of them take a radically different approach. Especially for tactics games, the single strategy seems to be overwhelm them with numbers. Maybe this works if you're the Soviet commanders at Berlin, but if you're trying to make people feel for these characters you're sending into battle, for storytelling, for gaming, that simply doesn't work. Zerg rushing is all fine and good if you're trying to win, but you don't feel anything for the people you're mowing down. Worse, when gaming tries to make it matter, again, they somehow make it even worse. And this is the Fire Emblem difference. For a game that started as a respectful, kind of loving homage to Western high fantasy that has lots of pretty anime boys and girls that you can date, that takes you to many different fantasy worlds, it's probably one of the best representations of life and death and war, of war in general, that gaming has. It's the thing that makes Fire Emblem matter, that permadeath matters, because the key to any tactics game, to any war game, needs to be this. Every move you make matters. Every soldier you have matters. And you need to make a decision as the commander ordering them around, just what kind of leader you want to be. Are you going to be the Shakespearean figure who would, oh brother, my brother, who would happily lay down anything, march into hell, so that all of your men can come home again? 
or will you kill your enemies by marching over the bones of your soldiers? That is the choice that you have as a commander in any tactical game, and the one that Fire Emblem, I think, tackles better than most. Maybe you're the kind of person who can play these games, learn about these characters, and then sacrifice them like pawns. But I don't think most of us are. And that's the central thing that Fire Emblem gets about war that most other video games don't. You are playing chess with human lives. Use them wisely. Yeah, this got dark, didn't it? <laughs> Let's go to a happier direction, shall we? Specifically, Fire Emblem's future. Where does the series go from here? We're probably three or four years out from the next mainline installment, so the obvious answer is another remake, especially because, again, you people came through, Valentia was a hit. We're getting more remakes. As for which ones? The easy answer is Genealogy of the Holy War. If there's one thing Game of Thrones did, it's that incest won't scare the censors now. <laughs> but honestly, I think the smarter option might be to remake the Game Boy games, especially Binding and Blazing Blade. We have the memory to put them on a combined game now. And it would allow us to bring back that generational mechanic we all loved about Awakening that we tolerated in Fates. <laughs> and it would let us play around with characters like Roy. Maybe having a different mother would give him different skills. Or father, for that matter. Who knows? But as for the other things, spin-offs. We're probably getting a lot more of them. I don't get what the deal with Tokyo Mirage Sessions was, but we don't need to. It sold well. It's getting a remake. <laughs> We're probably getting more crossovers. Hopefully, the next one will be a bit more Persona and a little less whatever the heck Tokyo Mirage Sessions was. I, why is Marth singing? Answer me that and maybe I can like this game. Again. But personally, one I'd like to see, just so the Smash Brothers fan base will quit yelling at us, a proper fighting game. Something, we don't get enough Soul Calibur games as it is. Toss a, bunch of, toss a bunch of Fire Emblem characters with their weapons into a fighter and enjoy swimming in your money, Nintendo. And, and, and if you think it won't, remember, Fire Emblem Heroes has made half a billion dollars for Nintendo last year, so. Maybe I don't spend money on it, but some of you are. But here's the other thing about Fire Emblem's future that matters. And this is where all of you get to take a bow. The best thing about this franchise is its fans. More than anything else, there is a reason why games like F-Zero, Star Fox, even Metroid, don't get the attention from Nintendo that they do. And it's that the fans simply aren't there, or if they are, they don't speak up. From day one here in North America, from the first time you saw that unlock screen pop up in Smash Brothers, this has been the franchise we've loved and that we've fought for every step of the way. And it's made a difference. You can't go to a convention anymore without seeing Fire Emblem cosplayers. And guys, you're a breath of fresh air from all the Deadpools and Harley Quinns. I love every one of you. For a franchise that I won't, I'm sure some of you as well felt like you were the only fan on earth that knew about this series. It's awesome that we have a room filled with people, standing room only. Yeah, take that in for a moment. <laughs> that you can come to a place like MAGFest, even as recently as five, six years ago, you could ask someone, Fire Emblem? Never heard of it. Now, they can see us, they can hear us, and so does Nintendo. May it always be so, because as long as Fire Emblem has fighters and fans, like every one of you, the future's a bright one for the series. And I'm quite fond of that. But, until next time, 
keep your blades sharp, your wits sharper, and I will see every one of you out on the battlefield.